I now introduce the book of Jonah, the story of a reluctant prophet. Questions of authorship and date of Jonah. The book itself is anonymous. It tells the story of Jonah, but it nowhere says that Jonah is the author of the book as we now have it. He's the author of the poem in chapter 2, uh, but not of the book as a whole. The narrator is the author of the book as a whole. And it's written in third person narrative style about Jonah. And as a result, it may well have been written well after the time of Jonah. So when you talk about the date of Jonah, you have to talk about two things, the date of Jonah the person and the date of Jonah the book. As far as the date of Jonah the person, well, Jonah seems to have been an 8th century or late 9th century prophet. He is mentioned in 2 Kings 14 and verse 25 as a prophet living at the time of Jeroboam II. And so the story of Jonah has to be, well, ballpark figure, we'll say 8th century, although late 9th is not impossible. But then the book could have been written any time thereafter. Now, the fundamental uh, critical issue in this book is the genre. Is this book history or is this book parable? Let me give you the case that Jonah should be understood as a parable. This view takes the story to be one, making a theological point, kind of like the parable of the Good Samaritan. It wouldn't matter whether there really was a Good Samaritan or not. It still makes a good theological point. And those that take the parable view of Jonah would say the same thing about the book of Jonah, that whether or not there really was a Jonah, that uh, nonetheless uh, the theological points are still well taken. Proponents of this view uh, uh, point to the incredible, Im incredibly Im improbable happenings within the book. So Jonah is told by God to go one place, he heads in the opposite direction. He uh, goes to Nineveh, preaches a half-hearted message for one day, and the whole city repents in sackcloth and ashes. And then, of course, you have the miracle of the being swallowed by a great fish. And you also have the uh, miracle of the plant in chapter 4 that grows up in one day big enough to shade Jonah. And proponents of the parable view would say that all these improbable happenings are the author's way of saying that this is not history. This is a parable. Again, Jonah swallowed by a great fish, whole pagan city repenting, miraculous gourd. Well, those are all improbable kinds of happenings. But then there's a good case to be made that Jonah should be understood as history. 2 Kings 14.25 indicates that Jonah was a real prophet. There it says... Uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II, that Jeroboam restored the border of Israel according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Goth Haber. And the book of Jonah also ascribes it to Jonah, the son of Amittai. So if Jonah is fictional, it's also slanderous. Why would you want, because it speaks of Jonah in less than glowing terms, being a disobedient prophet and uh, being reluctant to do what God wanted him to do, why defame a godly prophet, one might ask? 
Moreover, Jesus refers to Jonah as if he were a real historical personage. So in Luke 11.29, Jesus says, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The men of Nineveh will rise up and stand up against at, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. And uh, the parallel in Matthew says much the same thing. So if Jesus refers to Jonah as if he's a real historical personage, and the men of Nineveh who repented as people that will be raised at the resurrection and condemn Jesus' generation, uh, well, that's strong New Testament evidence, if you accept the authority of Jesus, uh, that Jonah was a real uh, person. So you begin the story of Jonah, the wrong way prophet, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. But he got on a ship heading to Tarshish, which is definitely in the opposite direction. Uh, he runs from God. He's supposed to preach to Nineveh in Assyria, but then he's to go to Joppa and from there to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. If you look on a map, Nineveh is uh, the same as... Uh, Masul in uh, Iraq, a place that ISIS uh, had held and was dislodged uh, in recent times. There isn't, actually, as I speak, it's in the process of being dislodged. I presume they'll be successful. Whereas Tarshish is uh, probably on the other side of Spain, a Phoenician colony of Tartessos in Spain, which would be just about as far in the opposite direction as you can get. Well, a storm wind comes up. Supernatural character was uh, clear that the sailors uh, suspected that someone had offended the gods, so they cast Lot as who might have done that. And uh, it fell on Jonah, who confessed that he was the cause. And uh, he tells them to throw him overboard. Uh, but they refused to throw him overboard. They had more respect for human life than that. So they make one last-ditch effort to get the safety without killing Jonah, but finally, after this fails, they, in essence, pray to God that uh, they were reluctant to kill this man, but God had forced them to, and uh, they toss him overboard, and Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. Now, the great fish, the question is, is that a whale? Uh, well, the text says a great fish. Perhaps a whale could be described that way. Uh, Jonah and the whale has become proverbial, but the text never actually says and uh, whales don't generally go in that part of the Mediterranean, but perhaps this time one did. Uh, in any case, it's a miracle and not a natural event. Some have suggested that Jonah was swallowed by a whale since being air-breathing, it could allow Jonah to live if it were caught in an air cavity of some sort. Uh, however, if you were swallowed by a, hell, uh, a whale, the digestive fluids would... Uh, do in any body that was swallowed. Uh, and uh, there are tales of seamen being swallowed by whales, but they're all sailor yarns. There's no solid historical one, uh, contrary to what uh, some internet rumors would say. Uh, but whatever the creature was, by pure miracle, Jonah survives. And then he is told, uh, well, he, he, in, the, in the belly of the fish, he realizes that God is going to deliver him from, from death, and so he sings a song of thanksgiving from the belly of the fish, though he is still unhappy with his mission. And there's no evidence that he completely repented of his reluctance to preach to Nineveh. His attitude uh, made the fish kind of sick, and it ends up puking Jonah out on the shore. 
Well, then he goes to Nineveh, but he preaches in kind of a half-hearted way, a kind of a joyless message of uh, judgment. Forty days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, the text says it uh, was about, it, it, uh, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. There's two ways of uh, explaining that. Uh, one would be to say that it's not just Nineveh itself, which it wouldn't take more than one day to walk around the city walls of Nineveh, but that perhaps uh, this is uh, talking about greater Nineveh that would extend uh, to the region and not just the city walls itself. But perhaps more likely, in my opinion, three days walk means it would take three days to walk through and preach down every street and alley, stopping here and there to give the message. Well, he only does it for one day, he gives up and goes on a hill to see what God would do. Well, you ended up with an overwhelmingly positive response in chapter 3. The whole city repented in sackcloth and ashes, starting with the king all the way down to the common citizen. Even the animals were dressed in sackcloth and ashes and ended up uh, fasting and not drinking, but bellowing to God. So what does Jonah do? Well, first of all, what God does, when God saw the, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring the destruction he had threatened. But this displeased Jonah. Jonah complained that God is too gracious. God is a gracious and compassionate God. That, that's a reason that, that Jonah didn't want to go. He, he figured that God would find some lame reason to forgive those blankety-blank Assyrians the Assyrians having been traditional enemies of Israel from uh, the ninth century on. He knew that God would forgive them, and that's why he didn't want to go. And uh, God gave him a lesson from a plant. It was a hot day, and so God allowed a plant to grow rapidly and shade Jonah. But then the plant that Jonah loved died, and he felt sorry when it died. And God indicated that, well, Surely, if you could feel sorry for a plant, why can't you feel sorry for these people, these people that don't know their right hand from their left? What's the message? Yeah, uh, Verse 11, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as uh, many animals? I think what that means is... Uh, do not know your right hand from your left, is that they're like children. They're, they're ill-informed about God's moral and spiritual requirements. And he takes that into his consideration. In any case, also much cattle means, well, if you can't feel sorry for the people, at least feel sorry for the poor animals. Thus ends the rebuke of Jonah's half-hearted attitude. What are the theological lessons of the book? One, it shows God's positive attitude towards Gentiles. Even Gentiles can fear God and be saved. Jonah, you might say, anticipates the missionary enterprise. We also see in this book that God is a God of grace. When people repent, he's willing to forgive. Uh, we also see the sovereignty of God. He controls nature, uh, storm winds, and fish. Uh, we also see the futility of running away from God, as Jonah tried to run away and found out you can't. Maybe some of us have tried, too, and found out that we can't either. Jonah's time in the great fish also seems to indicate that Jonah is a type of Jesus' burial in the tomb, and Jesus' ministry is compared to that of Jonah. And this analogy is even stronger if Jonah actually died, but then was raised to life after being swallowed by the great fish. Again, the passage that brings us out, Matthew 12, 39 through 40. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so Jonah foreshadows his death in the fish and being raised foreshadows Jesus' resurrection. 
And so that ends our introduction to the book of Jonah.